We're wrapping up our June Bible study uh, series. We've had very good, we've had a lot of really good feedback and we'll, we will do this again. Um, the study of the Bible is so absolutely interesting and more than interesting. It's important to who we are as the people of God. And we can do some things in a Bible study, obviously, that we can't do in a typical sermon. So we're gonna come back and we'll try this again some later in the year. I've been promising all three of these studies have been uh, centered around the writings of Paul. We talked about Romans on a couple of occasions and today we're gonna talk about his letter to the Corinthians. I promised that I would teach you a new word every week. And so here's your word for today, ecclesiology. I kept this out of the bulletin because I thought it might scare you off. It's not that hard of a word. Ecclesiology means uh, the doctrine of the church or the study of the doctrine of the church. When you look at Paul's letter to the Corinthians, he actually has two of them. You don't find a full-blown ecclesiology or doctrine of the church, but you find him talking about the church and you find the elements that you might use in developing your doctrine about the church. It's been important to me. I think it'll be, you'll become aware of that uh, as we go along in our study this morning. So ecclesiology, for those of you that like to learn new words, uh, means the doctrine of the church. Today we're going to look at the 13th chapter of his first letter to the Corinthians. It may be the most popular chapter in the entire Bible, probably the one that has been read the most more than any other chapter. How many of you have heard this read at a wedding? How many of you heard it read at at least a half a dozen weddings? <laughs> I, I've read it probably 80, 80 or 90 weddings or more. Let me encourage you, even though you know this text well, to pull out your Bible. If you didn't bring your own Bible, get a pew Bible. One of the things we want you to do is to get used to looking at the Bible, reading it, and thumbing through it. And uh, that can be intimidating for a lot of people. I think if you'll do this with us, you will, you will find it to be not nearly as intimidating as perhaps you thought. What I'm going to do, first of, all, first of all, is to simply read the 13th chapter the way you would hear it at a wedding. Beginning with the first verse, Paul writes, If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions and if I hand over my body so that I may boast and do not have, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Last week, I made a derogatory comment about Paul. I said he was a terrible writer. And if you read Romans, he is a terrible writer. He's redundant, he's obscure. Today, I have to apologize to St. Paul because of course, these are some of the most beautiful words ever written. Verse four, he tells us two things that love is and then he goes into things that love is not. He says, love is patient, love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, almost poetry, and yet so powerfully, so powerfully true. And then we'll skip down to this uh, last verse that we finished with in a wedding. And now faith, hope, and love abide these three, and the greatest of these is love. Now I have a question for you. How many of you believe that this 13th chapter in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians was originally written by Paul on the occasion of his niece's wedding? Please hold, raise your hand. You're laughing, so you're obviously, even if you do think that, you're not going to be dumb enough to raise your hand, right? <laughs> it wasn't. It wasn't. These words written by Paul are so appropriate for a wedding. You can take these words and set them aside, and they are a, a beautiful description of the qualities and the challenges of love. So they're appropriate for a wedding, they're appropriate for a group of people that are together. Almost any time the issue of love is relevant, these words are appropriate. Having said that, he didn't write these for a wedding. He didn't write them for a man and a wife. He didn't write them uh, for two people who are engaged. He, he wrote this, the letter to Corinth and he wrote this 13th chapter to a church 
And here's what you need to understand today, a church that was bitterly divided, bitterly divided. And so what we are going to learn today is the importance of reading a scripture, but how you can enrich the meaning of that reading by looking at the context, primarily what comes before and sometimes what comes afterwards. In this case, what comes before is extremely important and informative about the meaning of these words in the 13th chapter. So let me get you to move back there a few pages to the first chapter of 1 Corinthians. This is gonna be on page 166 in my, of the New Testament in my I've got a pew Bible, so it'll be pretty close if you're using a pew Bible. This is Corinthians, the first chapter, verse 10. And this is your first clue about what's happening in the church in Corinth. He says, now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement and that there be no divisions among you. First hint, right? No divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same purpose. For it, verse 11, for it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there are quarrels among you, my brothers and sisters. Indeed, indeed. When you read, start reading from that point on in this letter to the Corinthians, you discover that this is a bitterly divided church, that there are quarrels amongst them and more than one kind of quarrel. This is a church that Paul founded. He visited it on several occasions and he is very, very disappointed with what's taking place in Corinth. We're gonna talk about three of those divisions. One, there were, the church was divided in terms of its allegiance to various apostles. It doesn't take long to read through this. I hope you'll sit down tonight or tomorrow and maybe you can sit and read this in the whole book, the whole letter in one session. You can divide it up and read it on three different mornings if you want to. But it's this, unlike Romans, which is very challenging and difficult to understand, this is not hard to understand once you get that he's writing to a divided church. And so one of the things that we see is it was divided in terms of allegiance to apostles, three of them. Some of them were committed to an apostle that we know little about, but Paul was very respectful of him, a man named Apollos. The other group, another section was committed to, they, he refers to him as Cephas in here, Peter. They were committed to the apostle Cephas, a third committed to Paul. And they'd evidently gotten to quarreling and fighting about this so much that they said, no, your group is wrong, this group is wrong, our group is right. It had become very, very bitter. And Paul writes to them and he says, look, it doesn't make any difference from whom you first heard the word of Jesus Christ. It is the spirit and love of Jesus Christ that unites us. We are all in the same business. Stop fighting over which apostle you are loyal to. It's very clear cut and straightforward. There was another division in the life of the church at Corinth and it had to do with sexual immorality, the commitment of the sin of incest. And when you read this, it's clear that even though uh, there is a, a person in the church that is uh, engaged in sexual immorality, there evidently is a group of people that are supportive of him. And so the church is bitterly divided over this as well. And it's hard to know uh, whether these were the same people, you know, it, was, it may have been a pretty convoluted fight where you didn't know uh, who your friend was in the middle of the fight because they were fighting over so many things. And then thirdly, there were other divisions, but this, this is the one we're gonna talk about today. They were divided over the issue of spiritual gifts. Some of them were preachers. They practiced prophecy. Some of them claimed to have extra wisdom or knowledge. Uh, some of them claimed to have healing powers. Some of them spoke in tongues. If you like to learn new words, the technical word is glossolalia. They were practicing glossolalia. They were speaking in tongues. And the problem is that clearly when you read the, book, the letter to the Corinthians, some of them believed that they had more important or more powerful or more spiritual gifts than other people. They were being arrogant and they were being judgmental and it was dividing the church like crazy. So now, let's look at the 12th chapter. 
the chapter um, that precedes the great hymn on love. And if you don't read the, all of Corinthians, at least when you get a chance, you're not, not going to read all of the 12th chapter, at least when you get a chance, go back and read the 12th chapter and then the 13th chapter and you'll see what a difference it'll make in your understanding. It will enrich your understanding of the 13th chapter. The 12th chapter can be divided into three little sections. The first three verses really are verses in which Paul talks about the source of gifts. He says that the Spirit of God is the source of all genuine spiritual gifts. If it doesn't come from God, it's not a spiritual gift. Verses 4 through 11, he talks about the unity of the gifts, how they are all important. And we're going to read those seven verses Turn with me, I'm on page 174, so it'll be pretty close for you in the New Testament. The 12th chapter, verse 4, we're going to read this because it's really important. He says, now there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in every one. To each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom. That's a gift, wisdom. <clears throat> I've lost my place here. To another, uh, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another the working of miracles, prophecy. To another the discernment of Spirit. To another various kinds of tongues and to another, the interpretation of tongues. All of these are activated by the one and same Spirit who allots to each one individually, just as the Spirit chooses. So he's talking about all these different kinds of spiritual gifts. They're all important. Some of them can preach, some of them can prophesy, some of them have wisdom or knowledge, some of them are practicing glossolalia, they can speak in tongues, others can interpret the tongues. And the point that Paul is making here, he's, he's uh, making the underlying, ca the underlying case for his point. They, all of these gifts come from the same spirit. And so one is as important as the other. There is never any cause to believe that your spiritual gift is more important than the one that another person has. In the final verses of chapter 12, the majority of these verses, we're not going to read them. He talks about the diversity of these gifts and he compares them to the parts of the body. He says, think about the way the body is made. It, all the parts of the body are interdependent. The eye can't claim that it's more important than the foot. The hand can't claim that it's more important than the knee or the leg because the way in which God has created the body, all of the parts are interdependent, you have to have them all. And they all work together to be the body. Then he says, in the same way, that is the way the body of Christ works. You may have one gift, you may have another gift, you may have a third gift. All of these gifts working together are needed in order to form the body of Christ. Now I'm reminded of a cartoon I saw years ago by Charles Schultz who was a quite biblically uh, literate cartoonist and it was Snoopy and Snoopy was out jogging and he was jogging along the, his feet started complaining, said, My, we're, we're hurting. And then his knees started complaining, said, we're hurting and so forth. And finally the heart spoke up and said, just remember boys, if I go, you all go. <laughs> so it's kind of cute. It was a heart saying, look, I, I really am the most important. But trust me, in Paul's understanding, the spiritual gifts are, if they're given by the Spirit, are all equally important. But here's what was happening. There were some in the church who were claiming that their spiritual gift was more important and that they were spiritually superior to the others. Especially those who were speaking in tongues, practicing glossolalia. In fact, it is likely that some of those who were speaking in tongues were claiming that you couldn't really be a Christian, or at least you couldn't be a Christian on the same spiritual level as they were unless you spoke in tongues. And the church was coming apart. 
And I understand this completely. I'm going to tell you about a church that I served years ago. It's been over 30 years. I've never talked about this church explicitly in this way, but it's been 30 years, and so I'm going to today. It was a county seat church. It was a wonderful, I had a three-year ministry there. It was a wonderful ministry. But it was the only church I've ever served where there was a group of people in the church who were speaking in tongues. It was probably 12, 13, maybe 15 people in the church. And they would meet on a regular basis, speak in tongues. They never invited me, thank God. (laughs) I'd always heard two things about people who speak in tongues. I'd always heard that these were the most wonderful, generous, committed people you'll ever know. Kindest people you'll ever know. And I'd also heard that they were the meanest people you will ever meet. And I never, I never knew which until I went to that church and I discovered that both of those things were right. About half of these people who spoke in tongues were the kindest people I've ever known. If somebody died, they would be the first at the door with a casserole or a dessert. If somebody needed visiting the hospital, they would go to the hospital. When the offering plate came by, they were the first to reach for their wallet. They were the most consistent and generous people in our church. They would pray for you. They were remarkably humble. The other half were the meanest people I've ever known. They believed that they were more spiritually gifted than you. They believed that it was their prerogative to pass judgment on others who did not speak in tongues. And they were terribly, terribly divisive. Guess which one kind they had in the church at Corinth? I don't know, maybe they had both kinds, but certainly they had people in the church at Corinth practicing glossolalia, the speaking in tongues, and they were claiming to be spiritually superior to others. So here we find Paul talking about love as the unifying principle within the life of the church. And he says, if your gift does not come from God, it's not really a gift. And, in, and that's what he says in the 12th chapter. And in the 13th chapter, he says, is your, if your gift is not expressed in love, it is not a gift that comes from the Holy Spirit. And it becomes the great unifying, you could build a doctrine of the church on this. It becomes the great unifying principle uh, of Paul in terms uh, of how the, the church functions. And why is that important to you and me? Let me just tell you why it's important to us in the life of this church. This is a bit, not only a big church in terms of numbers, but it is what I call a big tent church. And we built it that way on purpose. We are a church that has a very diverse constituency. We have people in this church who are conservatives and people who are liberals. We have people who are Republicans and we have people who are Democrats and in between. We have people who read the Bible literally and we have people who read scripture liberally. We have all of these uh, different ideologies within the life of the church. And for 31 years, this church has never devolved into a church fight. Why? Because we've been committed to this principle of Paul that everyone is equal in this church in the sight of God. And we've practiced that in two ways. One is through the, the mission statement of our church. Love God. Serve others, transform lives. All of us, regardless of ideology or theology, believe in that and we practice it. Secondly, we have this understanding about the spiritual journey. We're all on a spiritual journey. You've heard me say many times, there are two kinds of people in this world. Those who are are on a spiritual journey and they know it, and those who are on a spiritual journey but they don't know it yet. And so we're all on a spiritual journey. If you're on a spiritual journey, you understand that somebody else may be in a different place on that journey, but you're still on the journey together, traveling together and learning together and learning from one another. And so like the church in Corinth, we have a church where we disagree about a lot of different things. Disagree about politics, ideology. We disagree uh, about scripture. 
There are these hot button social issues that we disagree about. The issue of same sex marriage, you've heard a lot about it. You're gonna hear a lot more about it in the life of the church. You're just going to. And yet you have already figured out as a congregation how to agree to disagree about this because you hold your sister or brother in Christ in higher esteem than you do the things about which we disagree. Rather remarkable. And it reflects precisely the church that Paul envisions. So now, let's go back to the 13th chapter. Having put this in context, having read some of the earlier scriptures, let's go back to the 13th chapter and let's read it again. And I want you to notice how much richer these verses are now that you understand what all the words are about because Paul uses every single word in here for a reason. Chapter 13, verse one. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. He uses those words, uh, that word tongues on purpose, doesn't he? If I speak in the tongues of mortals and angels, he's aiming this right at those who are practicing glossolalia. He does not condemn the gift at all. He never condemns it. But he says, if you're speaking in tongues and you're not doing so out of love, you're just a noisy gong or a clinging cymbal, something that makes really unpleasant noise in the life of the community that we call the church. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, if you're, if you're claiming all of these gifts so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. Third verse, if I give away all my possessions and if I hand over my body so that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. He's saying you may be the wealthiest person in town and maybe you come to church and when the plate comes by, you pull out your wallet and you give it all to the church. But if you've done it for any other reason out of love, it amounts to nothing. All of the spiritual gifts are measured by the gift of love. Then he goes on, talking to a divided church. Love is patient, love is kind, love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. Do you think he used those words accidentally? Not arrogant or rude? He knew exactly what he was saying. It does not insist on its own way. He knew what he was saying. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Now we're going to finish up by reading on to the end. And you're going to be reading, I think, what are some of the greatest verses in the New Testament. And I'll explain why. Verse 8, he says, love never ends. As for prophecies, they will come to an end. Not love. As for tongues, your tongues will cease not love. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For now we know only in part and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to my childish ways. So he, he's saying, he's setting you, setting you up for this, these last two verses. So listen to this. For now, and these are the great, some of the great verses, I think, in all the New Testament. For now, we see in a mirror dimly, but in the future, we will see face to face. Now I know only in part. Then we will know fully, even as we have been fully known. Now faith, hope, love abide these three. The greatest of these is love. The great... St. Paul, maybe the most brilliant theologian of them all for 2,000 years now, finishes this great chapter by saying, even I have no idea about what it's gonna look like in the end. I look and I think I have wisdom, I have knowledge, I've studied, I, I, I think I know the presence of Christ in my life, but when I look, I see things as if uh, in, in a flowing stream of water 
or in a, in a muddy mirror. I do not see things clearly. We will not know clearly until the end arrives. And what we see here is this great theme of humility that uh, flows throughout all of Paul's writings. We talked about it last week. Those of you who were last week, if you weren't, you can get it on the podcast or a video cast. Paul talks about the original sin. And there's Adam and Eve there and the serpent tempts them. And the serpent says, uh, don't eat of the, did God tell you not to eat of this tree? And, and, and Eve says, yep, we can't eat of that one. And the serpent says, don't believe him. God only told you that because this is the tree of knowledge. And God knew that if you eat of this tree, you will be as smart, as knowledgeable, as wise as God. The temptation was the temptation of pride. And so Paul makes the point that part of what it means to be faithful to God and to be a follower of Jesus is to retain a spirit of humility. And it flows throughout all of his writings and it is at the center of what it means to be a part of the church of Jesus Christ. So you and I are here today, close, this is it. You and I are here today and we've all received things as free gifts. We know what grace means, don't we? Because God has loved us even when we didn't deserve it. I have this saying, those of you who are grandparents can appreciate this. I say, grandchildren are the surest sign that God has blotted out all your sins because they're such a gift. We have, we're all here because of what we have received through God's grace. But then it is our time to respond. And as we respond and try to live faithfully lives as disciples of Jesus, the two things that are most important to us is the practice of humility, both intellectual and, spirit humility, and spiritual humility. Never ever judge. And the practice of the spiritual gift of love. May it invade our church. May the spirit of love conquer our lives. May it lead us forward in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.